What is the impact of all this change and emphasis on new technology? Eventually, this thought process leads to the difficult questions like will technologies like cell phones, computers, and the internet enable North Koreans to change things for the better in that country? And could they possibly even overthrow the regime? Or does the North Korean government and security structure have such control over this technology that attempts at positive change will be very difficult, if not impossible? So KEI is pleased to welcome Mr. Scott Bruce to talk to us today about the expansion of technology and how North Korea tries to use this technology to control its own society. These are fascinating, important issues, and we appreciate Mr. Bruce writing his paper and adding his thoughts to this conversation. Mr. Scott Bruce is an associate and former POSCO fellow at the East-West Center. He also manages a program on nuclear security for an NGO here in Washington, DC. He previously worked at the Nautilus Institute in San Francisco, where he was the director of US operations until 2012. In this capacity, Mr. Bruce traveled to North Korea and organized collaboration with North Koreans on a range of energy and resource issues, including energy security and sustainable mineral development. Please join me, join me in welcoming Mr. Scott Bruce. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. It's uh, my great pleasure to be here today. Uh, thanks to KEI and Nicholas for having me here. I'm very excited to speak on this. Um, most important part of these meetings, as I understand it, is the caveats. So uh, here's mine. Uh, these are my own opinions. They're not the opinions of uh, my employers or other organizations that I work with or their funders. Uh, if they're fantastic, I'll take full credit. If you find them distasteful, uh, the blame is all on me. Um, this is a, a new topic, but it draws heavily on work I did as a POSCO fellow at the East-West Center. That work draws on a research project uh, from the Nautilus Institute for Security and Sustainability. Um, there are a copy of the papers in front, so I will uh, try as much as I can to deviate from that. I don't want to uh, read something that you have right in front of you. Uh, it's not a good use of anyone's time. But clearly, I'm going to draw from that a lot in, in these remarks. And uh, I'll work on keeping it as brief as possible, because I would love to have as many questions as possible at the end. Um, North Korea is a place where the control of information is seen as a fundamental part of the country's security strategy. Um, North Korea has intentionally kept its population isolated from the outside world. It's intentionally limited the flow of information within and without the country, as well as in between uh, the North Koreans. North Koreans traveling abroad have political minders who maintain the ideological orthodoxy of the group. The system of familial punishment in the country means that their families are effectively hostage to their good behavior. Radios are tuned to only receive government channels. The same goes for TV. Foreign media is banned. So with all this in mind, the advent of cell phones, a controlled intranet, and limited access to the internet can be seen as a very much a revolutionary development in North Korea. Uh, it seems to be a very major change in the country's policy and could potentially open the door for communication between North Korea, the development of networks within the North, and some fundamental changes in the way the state is run. You know, I think immersed in this is this idea that uh, technology has a potential liberalizing effect. Uh, and in particular, uh, after the Arab Spring, there's a sense that information communication technology is poison to authoritarian states. Uh, we saw the emergence of networks that were instrumental in uh, facilitating the overthrow of regimes in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, we saw these networks being fundamental in organizing protests in other state in the region. So the question is, why wouldn't cell phones and the spread of this technology have a similar impact in North Korea? Well, it's worth noting uh, that the jury's still very much out on the liberalizing impact of information technology on authoritarian regimes. While I think many people see a, a direct connection between them, other scholars have uh, very uh, compellingly argued that these technologies are also tools that can be used uh, to spread propaganda, to surveil the public, and to enforce state controls. Um, there's been at least a few attempts to respond to this issue using data. One attempt looked at the increase in internet users in authoritarian states and one of the freedom indexes that uh, measures the degree of freedom within the country. Uh, what that study found was that what technology didn't necessarily lead to the liberalization of a state but it almost never uh, had the state's control mechanism improve. So it certainly wasn't a benefit to the regime. Now, 
uh, as germane to this conversation, for that study, North Korea was listed as a flat zero. There were exactly zero internet users in 2002. There were exactly zero internet users in 2012. So the country is certainly consistent. Uh, but as we'll see from this paper, that doesn't necessarily capture the story that's going on. Um, I think my point here is that we shouldn't look at information technology as a panacea, but instead think of it as a tool. And this is a tool that can be used to reinforce social control mechanisms as much as it can be used to disrupt them. Uh, the applications can be used to support institutional actors, in this case the North Korean state, uh, but it can also be used to support non-governmental actors in a distributed role. Uh, and of course, the impact of these technologies is going to be positive or negative, depending on the environment it is used and your perception of the place that they are applied against. The same technology that can facilitate popular protest against an authoritarian regime is the same technology that can uh, be used to uh, commit criminal activity. A few years ago, there was this great story about the use of cell phones in the Philippines, where in a closed session of parliament, where they were going to restrict certain forms of protest, cell phones were able to communicate with the public at large, uh, rallying the populace in a protest against the bill, uh, which later did not pass. Uh, it was a great testimony to people power. Uh, about a week later, uh, reading the same newspaper, there was a story about prison gangs in Brazil that were coordinating attacks on police forces using cell phones from prison. Uh, my point is here that uh, technology doesn't have a nature, it only has applications. And so rather than making an assumption that the advent of these technologies in the North is going to lead to a fundamental transition in the state, we should instead look at the way that the North Koreans have attempted to use this technology. My own assessment, as I know in my paper, is that when you take these different factors into account, if you look at how isolated North Korea is, if you look at the complete ban on foreign media, if you look at the, uh, the individuals that have been allowed to access cell phones, information technology, and other tools, you'll find that North Korea is a place where optimistic dreams of information technology-driven liberalism will go to die. Um, because when we look at North Korea, what we see is that the regime has attempted to mitigate the risks of this technology by integrating cell phones and the internet into its network of social controls. These follow the traditional tools of power in authoritarian country, material incentives for the elite, information control for the general population, and penalties for access to forbidden technology or use of these technologies to undermine the rule of the state. This is a system of bribes, blinders, and bludgeons, and the North Korean government hopes that this combination uh, will keep these technologies from undermining the rule of the state. So with all that in mind, what I want to do is explore the way the North has attempted to limit the impact of these technologies uh, so that it will support the rule of the state. I then want to look at the ways that despite these social controls, North Koreans can communicate with one another really in unprecedented ways now. Uh, and finally, I want to start uh, in by looking at some policy options to address these technologies in the North. Uh, I really want to focus on the technologies that the uh, North Korean government has allowed its population to have access to. I, I'm aware that there is another issue involving the use of Chinese cell phones. Uh, there's been a significant amount of scholarship on it. I think it's really fascinating. What I'm interested in is how the North Korean government has attempted to allow access to certain technologies in the hopes that it can have its cake and eat it too. Basically utilize them uh, to bolster the strength of the regime while not allowing them to undermine the rule of the state. So first, when we think of material incentives, we can start by looking at the technology that is present in the North and who has access to it. Because in short, cell phones, the internet, and the internet are a luxury reserved for the North Korean elite, by and large. Uh, in the 90s, we saw North Korea isolate the impact of the floods and the famine in the country by ensuring that the negative impact of these events hit the most marginalized elements of its population. Uh, we see the flip side of this in the provision of information technology. North Korea has allowed access to information technology to the most elite members of the state who the regime hopes will have the greatest stake in the ongoing survival of the regime as it exists today uh, and therefore the least incentives to take any measures to undermine it. Cell phones are their most common uh, information technology tool in the North but remain limited to the North Korean urban population. Government-approved Coriolink system uh, cell phones can call within the state. They cannot call outside of it. Uh, at this time, approximately 2 million cell phones are in circulation, uh, although, as, as some recent articles have noted, many of those are used by communication tools by, as communication tools by government personnel. 
Cell phones are relatively expensive, meaning that only the relatively wealthy can access the technology. Average monthly charges for the phones are around $14 a month, which is pretty expensive by North Korean standards. In addition, the subscriber network is limited to those with the time and money to take time off work, travel to the communication technology management office, and pay whatever fees are necessary to ensure their paperwork is processed. This means you have to be able to travel to where one of these offices is located. You have to be able to pay for your time to be off work. Uh, and the government has the ability to reject your application at any time. Um, the Coriolink network is largely urban. It covers Pyongyang and the major cities in the north. Since cell phones require a power source to work, their use is limited to areas with a reliable energy supply. Uh, in rural areas, the North Korean electricity grid is decrepit. Even if there is cell phone coverage, owning and using a phone is simply not practical. In these remote areas, we're talking about locations where most of the power is stored in, in uh, car batteries when it is available and used to heat water uh, in the evenings. In these cases, uh, using that power to um, power a cell phone, charge your battery, as opposed to heating water is just simply not a priority. Some privileged North Koreans have access to a North Korean intranet the intranet is a closed network. The North Korean government monitors the discussion boards and chat services it offers. It screens and approves any media on the network. Uh, the government bureaucracies in charge of screening this media are the same bureaucracies that are in charge of monitoring television and radio content in the North. So it's, it's pacified by the same standards that you would see on KCNA or some of the domestic uh, uh, information channels in North Korea. The exceptions to these controls are the super elite of the state who would have unfettered access to not just the intranet, but also the internet. It's not clear how large this population is, uh, although some speculation has said that it is as small as only a dozen or more families within the North. The access to information to the outside world with this very super elite population is not considered a threat to the state. Uh, these are the highest echelons of the government in North Korea. Uh, having information about the outside world is not a threat to the state because for all intents and purposes, they are the state itself. Some university students have controlled and policed access to the internet. Generally, the process involves them applying for access, justifying their need to use the internet for research on approved topics. The computer facilities are locked, search histories are monitored. The exception to this is the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology, PUST, a privately funded university in North Korea. Students at PUST have almost unfettered access to the internet, uh, although they don't have a tremendously strong uh, uh, internet backbone. Students do not have to apply for permission to access it. PUST is thus a really important test case when it looks at the role of information technology in North Korea. It's not clear if the students who graduate from PUST, having had contact with foreign teachers, having had access to the internet, uh, will be shuffled off to some ministry someplace or sent abroad where they will have limited access to the North Korean population, or if the government intends to really utilize the knowledge they have gained to their studies at PUST. Uh, the North Korean government also allows key North Koreans to use the internet for research or communication with the outside world and state sanctioned business. This business includes the array of DPRK propaganda websites, including KCNA, as well as tourism websites and other ventures aimed at bringing in hard currency from North Korea. For four years, Air Corio uh, had a Twitter account. Uh, sadly, this Twitter account is no longer in operation, but you had a North Korean that was updating uh, arrivals, departures every time an Air Koryu plane landed or departed. Uh, similarly, members of the Korean People's Army, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and others group, whose job entails gathering information about the US, ROK, and other sources, uh, can access the internet for research purposes. These groups are trusted to access the internet uh, because in their role promoting the state's interest, their access is undoubtedly also monitored and policed within their institutions. Uh, another critical population that we want to mention here is North Koreans abroad representing North Korean missions, consulates, North Koreans participating as part of international organizations, on workshops, or running a business or profit center abroad. Um, these North Koreans would have access to the internet based on the local capabilities in their country of residence. Uh, that said, these missions and profit centers will all have an ideological minder, uh, an officer responsible for ensuring that staff behave appropriately. Even when a minder is not present, North Koreans abroad tend to police each other. Members who have worked with NGOs, or excuse me, NGO representatives who have worked with North Koreans have noted 
that uh, it is not uncommon for North Koreans to stay in hotel rooms, two to a person, to be able to keep an eye on one another when traveling abroad. This system of, of uh, mutual monitoring uh, ensures that North Koreans are not likely to use their computers for unorthodox purposes or be seen using a local internet cafe. Um, cell phones and the internet thus function as material incentives for the North Korean elite. They function as tools for the North Korean government. In this sense, cell phones are another luxury item uh, that the regime utilizes for its own benefit and allows the wealthy to access as a material incentive. Those who have this access to this technology flaunt it. Uh, Andre Lankoff noted in one of his recent books that the USB drive is a conspicuous symbol worn by North Koreans uh, to show that they have access to this technology. Um, now, aside from providing tool, uh, excuse me, toys for the North Korean elite, the state's control of information technology affords it an opportunity to disseminate propaganda. Uh, in Rudiger Frank's recent unboxing of the North Korean tablet computer, he found that it came preloaded with a collected wit and wisdom of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, as well as books by Charles Dickens and Victor Hugo meant to illustrate the bleakness of life in a capitalist society. By some reports, Coriolink phones received daily propaganda messages from the state. Uh, internet control mechanisms involve limited access to facilities and surveillance of individual use. The North Korean government monitors most internet accounts used for business. Inbound communications are checked by a central authority and can be accessed by the email recipient only if deemed accessible. If you've worked for an NGO that has attempted to maintain contact with a North Korean liaison or interlocutor, Maybe during a time of political uncertainty, you uh, have sent an email to your North Korean counterpart and received a, a message could not be delivered response. In any other country, this would be an automated response telling you that the mailbox you were trying to access was full or the communication lines were down. In North Korea, this is actually a, a drafted response that's being sent to you that is telling you that your message will not be delivered to the individual you have attempted to reach out to. Um, in addition to uh, disseminating state propaganda, these technologies keep information from leaking into or out of the country. Coiling cell phones alleviate demand for Chinese mobiles, which function near the border by bouncing off Chinese cell towers and can call outside the country. Similarly, while they certainly can't hold a candle to South Korean soap operas, I believe that one of the uh, intents of widening access to the intranet in the north, which does have media uh, and discussion boards, is an attempt to provide an alternative to some of the South Korean soap operas and foreign media that have been slipping into the country. Uh, this is unlikely to be a winning goal by the North. Nonetheless, the regime is attempting to substitute a constructive technology that supports the regime for a potentially disruptive one. Uh, lastly, it's worth noting that the value in having a state-run network is that the government can shut down cell phones and pull the plug on the intranet if it becomes a threat to the regime. While well, governments in Tunisia and elsewhere found themselves at the mercy of social networks run by foreign companies such as Twitter and Facebook, North Korea is not going to be beholden to an externally controlled network, particularly if that network is in the control of a company in the United States. Uh, while Arasacom is responsible for building much of the infrastructure, the North Korean government is, uh, reserves the ability to take down this infrastructure if it becomes a threat to the regime. Now, the flip side uh, to launching this regime-sponsored network is a corresponding crackdown on the uh, unauthorized technologies and reinforcing the penalties for the use of forbidden technology. The North Korean government uses detection equipment to track users of Chinese cell phones. Those who use these forbidden mobile devices for business or other purposes have learned to use them away from home and in controlled short bursts to avoid detection. Other coercive measures include strengthened penalties for the possession of foreign media. Inspections and penalties for information crimes have been increased as a disincentive for the use and possession of verboten media. Legal restrictions for access to this technology have likewise been strengthened since the advent of the Coriolink network. While information technology has the power to uh, empower distributed non-governmental actors, the institutionalized and pervasive system of social controls in North Korea incentivize risk-averse behavior on the part of North Koreans. The Songbun hereditary class system in the North continues to determine access to resources and opportunity in North Korea. This system controls access to everything from food to health care to education to employment opportunities in the DPRK. This ensures that those with money in the North are those who are, by and large, more loyal to the state. 
While the system is by no means perfect, it means those with the money and opportunity necessary to access information technology are those with a larger stake in the survival of the state for political, economic, and other reasons. Similarly, the Songbun system means that disloyalty puts three generations of the family at risk. North Koreans have their own social network that goes back to the foundation of the state. Is the Inman bomb system of of uh, uh, of neighbors spying on neighbors and reporting them to the authorities? Uh, these social controls discourage the use of technology for destabilizing purposes. While the Inman bomb system has weakened over the last two decades, it still discourages the sort of social mobilization that communication technology would otherwise empower. Given that almost all access to the internet in the North is from a government-controlled facility, North Koreans are aware that their activity is, mon is monitored and moderate their behavior appropriately. If even watching a South Korean drama is a dangerous undertaking, then publicly communicating discontent is unlikely. The pervasive fear of being reported by neighbors tends to retard the development of non-governmental networks. Even while surveillance networks have deteriorated over the last two decades, monitoring the intranet and internet is still relatively easy. Our benchmark for this is in China, where companies that have attempted to start a bulletin board system uh, in companies in China are advised that they should hire at least one monitor or sensor for every 50,000 people that use their network. Given the very limited intranet use population in North Korea, uh, one sensor for 50,000 users is very, very manageable by the state and very easy to do and uh, rigorously monitor this communication, given the limited number of users of the system in North Korea. Furthermore, the availability of mechanisms to undermine the state does not necessarily indicate interest in using them. Many North Koreans, particularly the elites, will see their future bound with the state as it exists today and view government control mechanisms as a positive force for security and stability in North Korea. Even if North Koreans hate the system, they have little to gain by undermining it in many circumstances. This is particularly true for the business class that use Chinese cell phones and other communication technology to, uh, to arrange businesses between the North and China. Uh, undermining North Korea's role would mean being swallowed up by Chinese and South Korean business interests. A more realistic goal is going to be the, uh, the use of this technology for personal profit. Uh, to develop some sort of gray market business enterprise that would allow them to benefit within the North Korean system, potentially using cell phones to circumvent some of the institutional gatekeepers for these businesses. As Andre Lankoff noted, uh, the long-term interests of the North Korean business class might even coincide with that of the Kim regime and its, official, and its officials, even though they now see each other as a swarm of parasites. The use of communications technology in North Korea follows the totalitarian playbook of bribes for the elite, blinders for the masses, protecting them from ideologically impure content, and coercive measures to suppress threatening media and reinforce social controls. This system allows the North Korean government to focus on the constructive elements of this technology while minimizing the disruptive implications. Now, I've come across as very pessimistic on the use of this technology. So I want to shift gears a little bit, because while the system of while North Korea has attempted to integrate the use of this technology into its system of controls, North Koreans can communicate in ways they have not been able to in the history of the state. I think T. S. Eliot wrote, "It is impossible to design a system so perfect that no one needs to be good," and we certainly see that in place here in North Korea. Um, so while the North Koreans with access to information technology tend by and large to be the most loyal, uh, North Koreans can still communicate in ways they have not been able to before, which has in turn altered the way the North Korean government controls information. The most important shift is that the North Korean government is going to have to triage surveillance activities. With two million cell phones in operation in the North, the number of conversations in the state now exceeds the ability of the state security mechanism to track all the conversations. North Koreans use their mobile phones about as much as their counterparts in South Korea. It's just that in South Korea, there are more cell phones than humans, and in North Korea, uh, they've carefully allowed access to only about the eight uh, most elite percent of the country. Landlines in the North could be easily monitored. They were limited in number, tightly controlled by different bureaucracies, and used much less frequently than cell phones. The sheer number of conversations now exceeds the ability of the government to police them, and the state security department is likely to have to focus its surveillance on, on certain parties. Most notably, this will probably be foreign nationals and ideologically suspect individuals. 
It is also worth noting that information that uh, North Koreans can share has expanded. The ubiquitous USB drives, conspicuous symbols of, ac of access to information technology, allow North Koreans to share anything uh, from South Korean soap operas to personal data that they've written. Likewise, memory chips and cell phones can be traded and shared, allowing media to be watched on phones at home, in the street, or anywhere else. DVDs, the traditional means of sharing media, were much easier to track. There were case studies of officials shutting down power to a block and going through DVD players to see what DVDs were in their drives. USB drives, SD cards, memory chips, they're far easier to hide and share. When using government-approved technologies, North Koreans are also becoming information seekers. The very act of looking outside the country for information is unprecedented in the North. For example, the intranet now includes foreign, state-approved research on science and technology topics. Uh, this is consistent with Kim Jong-un's proclamation in 2012 that the internet should be used to harness scientific information from the outside world for development purposes. With these changes, the North Korean government has shifted from a goal of total information control to one of voluntary compliance with high penalties for transgression. Under the new system, networks can develop and share information, even if it's just between members of privileged classes. This creates a new space for non-governmental actors that did not previously exist. Unmonitored networks can develop and share a range of data and media easier than ever before. While penalties and social controls disincentivize these activities, space exists for networks to form in North Korea in a way that is unprecedented in the history of the state. Now, while the advent of information technology is not likely to lead to a radical transformation that empowers distributed actors, it is likely to exacerbate the influence of foreign media. Over the next decade, the combination of markets, generational change, and information technology does have the potential to fundamentally alter the state and creates a strong incentive to integrate North Korea into the economies of Northeast Asia. While the technology is not likely to be a driver of social instability or unrest in the country, cell phones, the intranet, and the internet facilitate the spread of social media and enable networks within the state that can be used and enable networks to form within the state that can be used for other purposes. Now, one opportunity presented by the advent of communications technology in North Korea is a possibility to try and circumvent the control of the state. This activity is already underway through many South Korean NGOs and media outlets that have distributed Chinese cell phones and other technologies to North Koreans uh, who then have contact with families and are able to report on information that goes on within the country. The goals for these efforts would include subverting control of the government and getting more information into and out of North Korea. Given that the North Korean state controls content and monitors discussion forums on the intranet, as well as a limited number of North Koreans with access to the internet, clearly the best tool for this is going to be cell phones. Although this application of mobile technology is certainly possible, overt circumvention efforts uh, have the high risk of provoking a crackdown on mobile phone users by the North Korean government. Uh, I think that there is a strong desire to encourage change in North Korea by widening the exposure to the outside world. However, Overt attempts at this are likely to result in a crackdown on the North Koreans who are targeted by it and ensuring shutdown of humanitarian channels with North Korea. In response to an information campaign involving leaflets uh, several years ago, uh, uh, the North Korean government executed anyone in possession with the leaflets or the money associated with them and shut down diplomatic relationships with South Korea. Likewise, there was a recent attempt to airlift Korean language versions of Wikipedia into North Korea. You may have seen this headline recently. Um, this is a very uh, interesting attempt. However, uh, there's a strong risk that the, that the technology is not going to end up in the hands of people who could actually use it, given the limited number of people who could make use of the technology, and also a very strong chance that those found to be in possession with it will face very harsh penalties. It's worth noting cell phones were banned for four years after the regime attributed an explosion at a railway station in the city of Ryangchong to a cell phone activated bomb. And while it is hard to imagine North Korea shutting down the network at this stage, uh, the DPRK could certainly increase prices to limit the number of customers, scale back future plans to expand the network, or take other measures to tighten controls over cell phones and information technology. Now, now this sensitivity that North Korea is displaying towards the use of this technology clearly indicates that it is a sensitive point for the regime. Uh, and that would indicate that there are opportunities there. It's just worth noting that overt attempts to circumvent control of the state are just as likely to burn bridges at both the state and non-state level as they are to build them. Alternatively, since the development of information technology in the North has the potential to encourage the long-term transformation of the state, 
A strategy for governments and non-governmental organizations could be to engage with the sector to encourage its development. One of the most promising ideas is virtual family reunions between North and South Korea. Uh, this, of course, would be predicated on uh, a dramatic improvement in North-South relations. Nonetheless, it would expand the use of information technology in the North, expand connections between North Koreans and their Southern cousins, uh, and have greater opportunities for communication between the two states. Uh, other attempts have tried to outsource this technology for the North. Uh, reportedly, some companies have had great success with this. However, most of this work is done through an intermediary, so the ability to control the actual access to technology or see what technology people are using is limited. Uh, a third attempt might be to actually engage with the sector. Uh, while attempts to circumvent the information technology system in the North is just as likely to shut down communication channels as build them, an investment in the North Korean IT sector is risky due to sanctions, weak governance, and other issues. Uh, a more effective strategy uh, might be to find ways to feed technical data that outlines best practices for economic development into the North Korean intranet. Topics for this could be something like a virtual private network or a research education network, REN, with the North. Uh, North Koreans, I think, would be likely to respond very well to this because it would allow them to control the information that's coming in. It would build contacts with the outside world while not opening the floodgates to a deluge of foreign media and topics. Uh, this, at the same time, would uh, be successful potentially at supporting economic development in North Korea, building collaboration between the North and the outside world, and increasing the reliance on information technology within the DPR Korea. So to wrap up, the advent of information technology in North Korea is a significant event. A fundamental part of the state security strategy rested in keeping its population isolated and uninformed. That said, the North Korea government is cognizant of the disruptive potential of information technology and have attempted to integrate access to cell phones, the intranet, and the internet into its system of social controls. Information technology is not a Trojan horse that the North Koreans have somehow let through their gates and brought into their kingdom. Rather than expecting cell phones, the intranet, and the internet to induce a radical change in the North Korean state, policymakers and others should adopt a more cautious approach. Overt support for information technology as a tool for circumventing state controls will result in further restrictions. Nonetheless, there is ongoing efforts uh, in disseminating uh, foreign media in North Korea that continue to widen the scope uh, of awareness of the outside world within North Koreans. Um, investing in technology in North Korea is very possible. Uh, impact remains limited due to the role of North Korean intermediaries, but it's still having tremendous successes there. And finally, a strategy to feed information into North Korea that will support development and necessitate links to institutions abroad can also help support uh, uh, work within North Korea to integrate it into the Northeast Asian region. All right, with that, I'm very happy to respond to questions that you have. All right, well, thanks for that, and let's do that. Let's open up to questions. We have some microphones here, so if you'll wait for the microphone, and then uh, please state your name and ask a question. We'll start right in the back there. Thank you. Yan Ho Kim with America. Uh, probably you're familiar with uh, my name uh, when you're doing this research. Two questions. Uh, would you a little bit uh, t talk more about the data uh, transfer service uh, in North Korea? Uh, how uh, do the people send uh, pictures or video clips uh, to their friends or families? Is that service available? Um, that's my first question. The second question is, there are a growing number of uh, reports that uh, a lot of merchants, not the elites, but the merchants, uh, doing business in the black markets are using uh, cell phones. And some people say without uh, cell phone, you cannot compete with other merchants. So that's kind of must for their business. So uh, I was wondering how the North Korean government uh, is perceiving uh, that kind of phenomenon and how they, the government is trying to control that. Thank you very much. Those are fantastic questions. Can you hear me OK through this mic? OK, great. 
Um, to answer your first question, the best study on uh, the transfer of technology is, is called The Quiet Opening, which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with. It came out last year. Uh, it looks at the use of these technologies. What you see are USB drives and memory chips being used to transfer technology as much as possible. They're allowed, able to store the data for these things and be watched on, on computers at home that may not have access to the Internet or on the cell phones that people use. Uh, I think one of the biggest drivers of the use of this information technology is the business class within North Korea. And I think North Korean government's uh, interest in allowing access to this technology is to enable efficiencies and to bring in foreign direct investment. So the economic benefit at both the personal and governmental level continues to be one of the major drivers of this transition within the North. Uh, for for people in the gray markets, the black markets, uh, it's very understandable that these phones are absolutely necessary. For other business interests that operate in terms of bringing things in and out of China, the Chinese cell phones are fundamentally necessary to maintain the networks of contacts. You simply can't do business anymore. And I think this is why we would be unlikely to see a complete rollback of the use of this technology at any point in the near future. Uh, to borrow Alexander Mansarov's term, North Korea's crossed the digital Rubicon, they can't go back anymore. That said, uh, at the point where the regime feels that these networks pose a threat to it, they can take measures to limit the spread and access to this technology. And the ways to do that would be to increase prices. Uh, it would be to uh, not expand efforts to access these technologies. It would be to roll back certain things. So uh, I agree with your assessment. I certainly think that, that these are instrumental for doing business at a variety of levels within the country, uh, and that indicates how essential it's become to the North. I think that it's very similar to the markets in the sense that uh, – it has taken root within the country to the point where it can't necessarily be rolled back at this stage. Okay, other questions? Yes, right up here in the front. The microphone's here. Thank you very much. My name is Adrian Mendrick. I'm the Department of State. Uh, you spoke a little bit earlier about uh, networks, and I'm particularly curious about the nature of interpersonal networks. Uh, over as, as they're conducted, as they're conveyed, as they grow over cell phone networks in North Korea. So could you extrapolate a little bit uh, on the nature of that communication and how those networks are formed and, uh, and how they're maintained? Well, there's no Pyongyang phone book. So a network has to be based on personal interactions and relations. Uh, that said, you see it pervasively within the capital and other places, people having access to it. Um, in terms of how these networks are formed, I don't know. Uh, they're formed based on personal connections and maintained through regular interaction. But as I noted in my paper, uh, North Koreans are as anxious to use their cell phones at all times as their southern counterparts. Uh, once Now that this technology is out of the bag, it's being utilized to the greatest extent possible within the North. Okay, other questions? Yep. Um, I just have a few questions regarding the content of the internet. You kind of alluded to it when you talked about the discussion boards and the internet specifically. But I was just wondering, so you mentioned how we could possibly introduce best practices to North Korea. I was wondering if the content of the internet was currently already focusing on very technocratic, technological means, the provision of development plans, engineering plans, blueprints, or if there's more focus on ideological spread, such as a Pyongyang law review. Something so. It, it, it contains all of these things. Uh, you know, fundamental to it from its advent were uh, collected works of Kim Jong Il and Kim Il Sung, uh, various data that were the formation of the state. Um, you know, all of the things that are used to enforce the ideological uh, orthodoxy within the North. <laughs> However, there is uh, increased reliance on the intranet within universities and among scientists, technicians, and engineers. This has led to uh, the incorporation of more technical material within the intranet system in the North. This is where I see there being a real opportunity. Uh, once this information gets in there, it can be propagated quite uh, rapidly within the country, shared between different networks and has a potential to uh, be sort of a force multiplier for so much of the different NGO activity going in the north, trying to improve some of the development and economic data there. And I think that having done work uh, on trying to foster this sort of economic development in the north, there's an underlying point to all of this engagement in the north which says at some point you're going to have to change your system for this to really work. 
in agriculture, at some point you're going to have to really allow some stimulus to happen to control uh, or uh, encourage the development of certain materials in the agricultural sector. In the energy sector, you're going to have to open up if you want to be able to rehabilitate your energy sector. And so using these networks to spread technical data really is going to have an invisible point within it, which is to really make this work, you're going to have to open up and model the behavior of other countries, which means reforming the system and opening up to some access and opening up access to the outside world. Okay, other questions? Maybe how much do you see, I know you talked about the cell phones and technology being um, business driven or in, in, in direct, uh, foreign direct investment driven. How much is it a response to North Koreans knowing the Chinese have this technology and knowing the South Koreans have this technology, so we need to um, allow something to, to say we're not, you know, we're not different and we're, and we're able to um, do the same things that these other countries are able to do? You know, I think the, the idea of material incentives is based a lot on the knowledge that other countries have this, and they want to be able to provide the elite with a similar capability even if it is technically limited compared to what Chinese and South Korean cell phones can do. Um, I would say that the primary drivers for North Korea was really this attempt to be able to access foreign direct investment. You have what some North Korean defectors who worked on the country's IT infrastructure called the mosquito net strategy, which is uh, an attempt to be able to uh, allow... uh, foreign direct investment from the outside world to come in through the use of technology while keeping uh, harmful content at an arm's length. That said, um, you know, the idea, the old idea that the North Korean government used to promote, there is no country on earth that can envy us, has fallen apart over the last 20 years. And it fell apart once the government started sharing videos of South Korean protests in North Korea. Because the North Koreans who saw these videos are not stupid. Uh, While these videos were meant to demonstrate how unhappy South Koreans were with the United States government, they would still say, okay, well, for a group of really miserable people, everybody seems to have digital watches. And those are a lot of really tall buildings in the background. Uh, And so there became an awareness of the disparity. And Brian Myers, uh, Andre Lankoff, and others have written about how the, the shift in North Korean statements has gone from no country can envy us to look at what we've accomplished in spite of the following, right? Um, and I think the attempt to allow greater access to cell phones and information technology within the North is an attempt to provision some of that same access that the elite know goes on in the outside world to its population as a material incentive to keep them happy and satisfied. How did you take um, North Korea with uh, Eric Schmidt's visit and and how they handled him and and what happened during that visit as far as wanting science and technology but not really engaging him or um, giving him the the most access that he could have gotten when he was there? Well, you know, Eric Schmidt's been quite clear that he sees technology as having a transformative impact on authoritarian regimes around the world. North Koreans know this. Um, They wanted to show off their technology. Look, we're a normal country. We have access to computer labs. We have access to the Internet. Look at what we we can do. By his own notes, when he went to these labs, it was North Koreans pretending to be busy on computers that weren't necessarily connected to anything. Um... Uh, that would under no circumstances make eye contact or interact with him. So, you know, I think that there was very much a a Potemkin computer lab effect that we saw in that visit where they were attempting to demonstrate their capability uh, while at the same time not really engaging on what they would have known was part of the underlying message uh, in the Google visit, which is a desire for information technology to have a transformative impact. We've certainly seen this in Google's role in China, Um, given the problems that Google had in China, I would be very hesitant to think of how Google would be able to work in North Korea. Other questions? Yes, I'll go back to Troy. Hi, Troy Sarah. We, you know, some of the recent revolutions, protests, um, we've seen cell phone networks get hijacked to deliver messages to protesters, oftentimes to discourage them. Uh, what is the prospect of doing this essentially in reverse in North Korea? 
and tapping into Northridge's own network to send messages to the room from outside rather than and necessarily the protesters on the inside. Um, well, you know, the cell phones are a limited network. They can't contact out. There's always stories of attempting to find new ways to circumvent it. And I know with the Chinese cell phones, there's a game of cat and mouse going on where they identify new means of circumventing the system. Uh, and then the government has a corresponding attempt to crack down on those technologies. They change up mix their strategy and try a new attempt. Uh, and on one hand, that goes to show, as it was mentioned earlier, that the use of cell phones is fundamentally important to anyone doing business across the Yalu. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it means that there's an ongoing attempt to suppress the use of robotin technology in the North that makes it very challenging. Um, I think there's another note that's worth going on here, which uh, is that you know, cell phones carry a history of everyone you called. And uh, when you seize a cell phone, you can look at the networks that are in that phone. Uh, and so you have a chance for a crackdown on one individual to be able to spread beyond that individual to the different people in their network, which puts networks at risk when a single individual is, is caught. Um, when the two uh, reporters were caught sneaking into North Korea, I know that they had been surveying uh, the Underground Railroad of getting defectors out, and there was a lot of concern, which the reporter said should not be a concern, uh, that their network then became exposed because they were caught, which sort of shows you the vulnerability of a whole network based on a single individual. So uh, I think there's opportunities to get information in and out. I know that South Korean NV NGOs have been very active at trying to use Chinese cell phones to get things in and out. At the same time, uh, the North Korean government itself is not blind to this issue and has been attempting to, as effectively as possible, clamp down on the use of the technology for these purposes. What else does North Korea need to um, expand? I mean, talked about the energy issues and, and uh, um, power issues to expand some of this technology to the rest of the country. Is that something that you see them trying to do, or do you think they're okay with having... Uh, the technology and cell phone usage um, be mainly based in their urban and uh, urban and main city areas? I think the primary interest in the North is to keep this isolated to the elite population, or at least the nascent middle class and elite population, which is going to find largely in the cities, particularly in the capital. I don't think there's a particular incentive uh, for the North Koreans uh, isolated in small villages who are not able to travel beyond those villages, have very limited contact outside of the small area where they've been born uh, to have access to this technology. And I don't know what they would necessarily use it for. Uh, their lives are very uh, controlled within this small area. So I, I don't see that as being a priority for the regime. Uh, I think that uh, potentially they would like the network to be able to spread across the country so that people traveling from the city, if they are in remote areas, could use their cell phones. Um, uh, which they can, by and large, do now. However, uh, getting the, the very lower class populations uh, outside of the cities, I don't think they're a target for the regime to spread. So for like the ideas of SEZs in every province and, and things like that, you would still need some of the technology and access and power for those programs. Th that's true. Uh, and one of the main drivers of this, uh, if you look at feedback from Chinese investors in North Korea, their number one complaint is, I can't access anyone back in China. I can't access my cell phone. Uh, I can't call home. I can't use the internet. And so I think one of the first steps would be to uh, make sure that the signal is available and then allow uh, foreigners to have cell phones that they could use to contact out of the country. This would facilitate business within these SEZs. Uh, in terms of extending that to some of the North Korean populations, that would be a challenge. And then you have the extra challenge of making sure that the energy infrastructure is able to to reach to these areas. You know, if you looked at the headlines recently, the way to get uh, a reliable energy infrastructure to the Rasan group was to build a tie line into China. It wasn't a matter of rehabilitating the North Korean system or rehabilitating the North Korean grid. They gave up on that. They said, okay, well, let's just connect it to something that's already present in China. Um, so I... I think it's, it's going to be very difficult to imagine what you would do to maintain a reliable energy supply in some of these other SEZs that the regime imagines right now without a large-scale repair of the North Korean energy infrastructure, which is an exceptionally expensive undertaking. If you look at that infrastructure, uh, it's been falling apart. 
It's based on uh, tools that are no longer made. The countries that manufacture these tools don't exist anymore because they fell apart 20 years ago. Um, uh, certain substations are being, you know, the the uh, indicators don't work anymore. They burnt out. North Koreans are uh, controlling the flow of power based on estimates of what's going in and out of the system. Uh, this is a tremendously expensive project to undertake, to rehabilitate. It can't be done in small areas. It can't be done in small groups. You're looking at a complete rehab, and you're really looking at building it from scratch. You can't rehab the system that's there right now. Um, so uh, if you're going to do that, it's going to be a comprehensive thing. And I think it's unlikely that foreign investors from China and elsewhere are going to pay for that large-scale transformation of the North Korean energy sector. Uh, it simply doesn't work out economically to make it worth their while to invest in an SEZ uh, in addition to building all the other infrastructures, such as roads and other things that they would need to access it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, on the back. You mentioned the, um, the inability to hold back some of these technological advances, uh, but and the in, and how integral they are to a middle class and upper class state of life in Pyongyang. Um, at what point do these uh, technological interests become something that is distinct from, if not oppositional to, the state itself? Like, uh, when could it be a property right that could be claimed by the middle class? Um. You know, uh, I think Alex de Tocqueville had this great quote that said, um, Americans never use the term peasant because they have no idea what that particular term denotes within their society. Uh, I think that when you talk about words like reform and property rights in North Korea, it, it's unclear what that meaning has to many North Koreans right now. And so talking about when that consciousness would develop within them it is really going to be contingent upon a variety of other factors going on within the North in terms of more awareness of these technologies. Now, uh, it's worth noting that during the floods and famine, there were not popular uprisings. However, when they attempted to limit access to some of the markets, you saw small-scale protests within the North. I think that you would, I would expect to see something similar if there were attempts to roll back access to cell phones within the North. Uh, well, I don't think there's a consciousness that associates them with property rights or as property, I think that you would see a, a tremendously negative response uh, that the regime would, would not attempt to, uh, to begin to do there uh, if you were attempt to try to roll back access to this technology within the North. But that said, uh, as I mentioned within, in my talk, I could see more barriers to entry uh, to be put on the access to technology in order to limit its, its spread within the North and control its access. Okay, any other questions? I think we talked about a lot of issues and a lot of um, interesting things to watch in North Korea. So please join me in thanking uh, Mr. Bruce for his paper and his presentation.